Good morning. My name is Louis Koritsky. I'm a family medicine physician speaking to you from Gainesville, Florida at my home. I was requested by David Victor, who is the person that has created some of the educational experiences that you're going to view, to share a few words with you about coronavirus. I'm 73 years old, and as most of you probably already know, persons in my age group and a little beyond that are at highest risk for coronavirus. So I do have some thoughts about the issue I'd like to share with you. I'm not very good at predicting the future. I do pretty good at predicting the past. But I'm going to try to take some steps to predict for you logically what I think is going to happen and what you and I should and could be doing to minimize consequence in this difficult time. I wish there were a way to completely eradicate risk, but no such thing exists. I also think there are many, many, too many unknowns to provide ac accurate risk prediction right now. And I want to go through with you just why I think that's the case. First of all, the coronavirus is, as you know, a new virus in this particular flavor. It's not that we haven't had coronaviruses before, but we haven't had a coronavirus like this before. You might say, could we draw on our experiences from other people in other lands like China and Italy, which are wrestling with very high volume coronavirus disease? I'm not sure if we can, and let me explain to you why. We know that in China, individuals have had a substantially more experience with coronaviruses than you and I have likely had. Remember, that's where MERS and SARS viruses started out, and as a result, might we expect, for instance, that the background exposure to coronavirus being higher, that population would have an innate more resistance to a, a new evolution of a coronavirus? So might that mitigate the disease consequences in a population already exposed? That might be the case if we draw upon knowledge of prior flu vaccines and know that even if a flu vaccination is not perfect in alignment with the current virus, that some of the cross-reactivity might breed some relief, then I wonder if we can rely on looking that information in the eye from China and saying, well, since these people have had more experience with coronavirus, might they have less consequence? We might look to Italy and say, all right, well, is this population representative of what you and I might experience? And I'm not sure about that either, because both Italy and China have a much higher smoking incidence than currently is true in the U.S. In 2019, we we're told that only about 14 percent of adults smoke. In China, in 2018, 58 percent of adult males smoke. There's also different exposure to fumes and kick cooking fuels and things like that in China than there is in the United States. So I wish I could say, yes, we can rely upon the information we've seen from China and Italy to guide our future, but I don't think we can. So let's hope that we can get some guidance and, and hope that the mortality rates that we're seeing in other nations of 2 to 4 percent on average are something that we can look forward to to instruct our patients. Now first, if I were you, and I'm, I see patients in a clinic uh, that's a general diverse clinic on a regular basis, what would I do tomorrow to reduce my risk from coronavirus? Well, first I'll rely upon the words of Winston Churchill, who said that fear is a reaction and courage is a decision. If people are fearful and they panic, then they're more likely to do sloppy things impulsively that won't be to their advantage. And I think we should make sure that we don't fall into the category of doing sloppy or impulsive things either. The first step I would take tomorrow is if you have the option to do this in your clinic, see if you can restructure your visits to prioritize fever and upper respiratory infection visits to the end of the day. For instance, I have suggested at our clinic that we schedule patients with URI or fever at 4 p.m. and later. Why? Well, we don't want those patients sitting in the waiting room exposing other patients. Secondarily, if we have a patient that we think is at risk of corona, and literally yesterday we did not have coronavirus testing available to us in our clinic. We had to send patients to the health department 
uh, and possibly to the local university, so, but we didn't have it in, in our clinic. We don't want people being exposed, and since we don't know who has coronavirus, my suggestion is that persons who could be at risk for that diagnosis be seen in one area of the clinic at the end of the day. That also enables us to only have to clean those rooms or give special cleaning procedures one time at the end of the day rather than sequentially patient after patient after patient. Also, since URI visits are going to likely be very brief, and the same way with fever, I think we can make those visits shorter towards the end of the day. As far as you and I and our protection of our patients and protection of ourselves. It certainly makes some sense to make to wear masks and there is a suggestion that the N95 mask might be a superior mask for prevention of acquisition by, of coronavirus by clinicians. I suggest to you that you wash your hands both when you enter and when you exit the room conspicuously in front of the patient to show them if you take hand washing seriously and you're a health professional, maybe they'll, they will also take this same process very seriously. As far as gowning at this time, I don't think it makes any sense in our community in Gainesville, Florida. The prevalence of the disease is so low that we don't have, a, to my knowledge, a single case that has been discerned within our own clinic setting. So I don't think any extraordinary measures are necessary for that type of protection at this time. I think simple hand washing techniques should suffice. As far as recommendations to patients, my suggestion to you is even though they're likely watching the news and they're receiving guidance from reputable sources like people at the CDC, they probably trust you more than they do some distant source. So my suggestion to you is create a fact sheet for your patients that can be updated and printed out at will, either on your website or maybe you'll have a sheet that you will hand your patients. So they'll say, well, what should I do with my 75-year-old mother who's living with me, should she take any spe special precautions? Decide what precautions you think that she should take. Be in line whenever you can, of course, with the recognized authorities like the CDC, and have that available to give to them so you don't have to spend your precious time again and again explaining it to the people the very same things that you could have explained to them on paper and give them as a handout. When we have coronavirus testing readily available, I think it will be valuable to do on a mass basis because we don't yet know the transmissibility of the disease when persons are very early in the course and possibly even asymptomatic persons. So for now, I think our steps are fairly clear. The risk to any one individual is extraordinarily low. We know that worldwide deaths in persons who are less than 30 years of age are rare to vanishingly present. For persons who are over 60 years of age and beyond, the risk rises very steeply, and especially in persons with comorbid disease. Everyone should protect themselves. And I remember the evolution that happened with flu vaccine. We used to do a stratification. We would designate persons at various levels of risk, one to five, with one being the most severe and five being the lowest risk. And then we decided, you know what, anybody who wants to be able to reduce their risk should be availed of a risk-reducing tool, the flu vaccine. So I think we want to encourage everyone to do hand washing, to maintain social distancing, to avoid crowds, and crowd definition, remember, has just changed from uh, groupings of more than 250 people down to groupings of 50 people or more. And that we can advise our patients safely that using those simple tools, hand washing, and avoidance of crowds and social distancing will likely reduce the consequences of this disease. The part that's most frightening to our health authorities is the persons who develop severe disease. Again, those persons over 65 and those persons with chronic disease or immunosuppression. And the reason is because we've not been in a situation before when we might anticipate a high volume need of intensive respiratory care at one time. Even if the tools that we use, such as hand washing and social distancing and avoidance of crowds, are not going to change the ultimate number of persons who get the disease, but spread that number out. That alone will be a tool to ensure that all those persons who do need intensive ventilatory support will likely be able to get it. I want to 
also encourage you about a term that's been used in the psychological literature about what's called swan posture. Swan posture is where on the surface of the water you are in, you are in, in graceful repose, despite the fact that underneath you're paddling quite fast. So I think if we, if we demonstrate and echo a, a pathway of calm and resolve in the face of a serious challenge, our patients will likely endorse that same posture and go forth with much less anxiety than they would otherwise. I wish I could help you to avoid this terrible problem, but there is no risk-free path in life at, for any of us, and all we can do is try to help minimize risk for our patients. I think we should continue to observe the wise counsel of our experts in infectious disease. I do not claim to be an expert in infectious disease or disease transmission. I, I don't have any particular you know, affiliations with expert groups on this topic, but was instead asked to give advice to you as I would see it simply from the perspective of a family physician and one of your colleagues. I hope some of my words may help you to feel more comfortable during these difficult days.